I was just out looking at the moon, you know, to, oh. to refresh my memory. Out the moon. First of all, it, it looks very round, although you couldn't tell it from down here. It's very deserted. Welcome to Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. This is week 48. I'm Misha and I'm this is Diane. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, finished watching episode 233 of Santa Barbara, and I assume that uh, everyone watching has also watched that episode. You could find it on several places on YouTube or your old VHS tapes. Um, sadly, Santa Barbara is not available on DVD or online streaming anywhere. So there are not too many options for you to find a 35-year-old uh, soap opera to watch, but um, if you want to play along as we go through the series one episode at a time, your best option is just to keep searching YouTube. There are at least uh, 900 episodes, the first 900 episodes available, which should get us almost halfway through the show. So, episode 233 aired Monday, June 24th, 1985. And Amy is angry with Brick. He shows her the documents with Dr. Renfro's name on them. And they discover from those that Jack Lee had paid for all of Amy's medical bills, including going back to the clinic that uh, she first attended in San Francisco, which is the most suspicious part of it. She calls Jack, and he seems to have an explanation for it. He says, you know, he had, you know, realized that she was having trouble paying her bills, and had asked Dr. Renford just to send all her bills to him, and he paid mm -hmm. them, uh, like any good employer would. Uh, he neglects to mention having paid any bills from San Francisco. She asks him if uh, he only paid for the ones uh, since he hired her, and he says yes. Mm -hmm. So she realizes Jack is lying, and when he returns later on in the day, uh, Amy asks if he really thinks she can get her baby back. And uh, he says, oh, I, I really ought to talk to Brick. And as he sits by his desk, he pulls his gun out mm -hmm. and says, I'd drop everything if you could just possibly tell me where Brick is. <laughs> so I don't know if he's planning to kill Amy and then Brick. That would be uh, quite a turn of events. I I sort of thought he was just preparing the gun, although it did seem weird that he was doing that with Amy sitting in the room. Um, mm. But uh, Well, that's the reason yeah. I thought it's that Amy might be in danger, because he didn't wait for her to, yeah, to yeah. leave, you know, or, you know, to tell him where Brick is. She certainly, I would think, should, should be, if she's not, she should be a bit alarmed that he seems very focused on Brick, and uh, that he would be in any way perhaps bothered by Brick being the one to to uh, cast suspicion, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brick has never been a big fan of Jack Stanfield Lee or Dr. Renfro, but uh, the fact that uh, Jack is, is so, you know, he's sort of ignored Amy's line of questioning completely because he's so focused on Brick. I think he must realize that Brick must have broken into his mm -hmm. files and got the information from there, and then it's not too much of a leap to think that Amy might have seen the paperwork, and maybe he realized between that phone call and coming back from Lone Pine mm -hmm. that she must have seen the document from San Francisco, too, and that maybe she's on to him. That's it. That's what I'm thinking. So, Brick may be on the run from... Jack Stanfield Lee in the next episode. Mm -hmm. Amy and Brick might be on the run. And maybe they'll somehow run into Nick and Kelly. Who knows? Mm -hmm. They'll both be on the run in silo country. Although it's several hundred miles to Lone Pine. Mm -hmm. So unless they use Jack's jet and helicopter. Um, Maggie and Warren are about to have a candlelit dinner now that Ben is, you know, safely tucked away in the hospital. Uh, when Lakin arrives, and she seems to be a little annoyed that Warren is cozy with this married lady. Uh, she wants to tell Warren that Augusta will probably need them both to be home later when she gets mm -hmm. back from the adventure at the uh, soundstage that Lakin knows all about. 
uh, when they get home, Lakin notices that Minx's locket is missing, which mm -hmm. uh, I guess Minx had entrusted Lakin to have the class repaired, and that's the locket that Christy stole. Yes, uh, I yesterday. think so. Yeah. Or Friday, I guess. We were was. trying to identify what that necklace might be, so mm -hmm. that sounds like what it was. So it could be a family heirloom. So Augusta will, of course, have seen Christy steal those candlesticks mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, Christy might not be staying at the Lockridge's for very much longer. Yeah. Um, Warren uh, takes the opportunity to ask Lakin why she was being rude to Maggie earlier. Um, but of course, Lakin says it's, you know, because Maggie's married. But um, I don't know how that conversation ended. Yeah, I don't really remember. I think I must have zoned out a bit of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've, I always find it sort of amusing when Lakin becomes quite. You know, she gets quite moralistic about things sometimes, and certainly has with Ted as well. But, you know, then when we kind of look at the behavior of her parents, the fact that, I mean, just in this episode, she's sort of abetting her dad to um, deceive her blind mother in a soundstage with another man, you mm -hmm. know, that's not entirely moral behavior either. She says to Warren, I didn't know how to act. And then I think uh, Warren is kind of safe from that conversation when the phone rings and it's Maggie saying that she just got a call from the hospital and that Ben has gone into cardiac arrest. Mm. So Warren rushes over there and Warren uh, learns that Ben has been saved by the doctors. And Maggie says if he'd been at home with me, he'd have died. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, the doctors had said that they just got to him in time because he was already in the hospital. So. So she'll, I, I would think that would make her feel a little bit better about her decision to finally put him in well, basically long-term care, I mm -hmm, guess. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the day, back up at Lone Pine, Kelly awakens and can't remember anyone. She can't even remember her own name. So either the machine has been on too long or uh, it... Worked a little more fiercely than Dr. Renfro thought it would. Mm -hmm. uh, Faux Jack tells Kelly that Nick kidnapped her. And uh, the henchmen then grab Nick and try to erase his memory while Jack takes Kelly into the other room and tries to, you know, say, oh, you know, you can't go back uh, to Santa Barbara just yet. You need to relax. But then he locks her in her room, which she finds suspicious. Yeah. So. Uh, Nick manages to get the gun and uh, holds it on the henchman and Jack and Renfro and man manages to get past them through the door into the hallway and bars it, I think with an axe probably. And um, Kelly comes out of her room, or he lets her out of her room, and he says that uh, they wiped her memory and that uh, they're going to try to kill her. And I guess she finds Nick just a little more believable than the others because she agrees to go with him. And uh, Jack or Renfro or one of the henchmen uh, smashes through the window uh, with an axe to get at the door lock. But Nick and Kelly managed to get on the motorcycle in time. It's interesting in a way to speculate if, if Jack hadn't locked her in that room and you know sort of seemed to undercut what he was telling her mm -hmm. if maybe she would have stayed with him. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, I get the feeling that they're gonna gonna go with Nick has a good, or Kelly has a good feeling about Nick just because of his kindly ways. So. She may have some residual memories stashed way back there too that are influencing her as well. Mm hmm so the two thugs, Chuck and James, fire at Kelly and Nick as they motorcycle away. So I don't know if that's going to ruin the plans to have, you know, Nick implicated in everything if they end up shooting both Kelly and Nick. Um, Renfro and Jack don't seem to stop them. And then Jack actually says, you really botched this, Renfro. So it seems like Renfro is in charge of that operation. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the higher-ups will uh, not be too happy about this. Yeah, it is actually an interesting scene when you think about it because Renfrew's 
put all of this effort into this experiment and he really hasn't fully seen its results because Kelly got yanked out of the machine and now she's racing off on a motorcycle. So you would think that he would be quite upset at someone shooting his subject before he's even had a chance to really examine them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you say, you know, this could really spoil their case in trying to make Nick the bad guy, especially with Kelly, if they ever try to convince her to come back. Mm -hmm. Not only because she knows they were just shooting yeah. at them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I did. I I was thinking, um, you know, when we, we were talking about uh, Jack Stanfield Lee now, perhaps going after Brick. I was thinking, well, how many henchmen does he have? Really, is he going to send them all off after Kelly and Nick, or is he going to, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't that we've seen he doesn't have a huge army of henchmen to pursue all these different angles. Yeah, Renfro, Chuck, and James are all in Lone Pine. Um, we haven't seen Parker Simonson for a long time. And uh, yeah, that's all we know about the operation. Mm -hmm. uh, the bike ends up breaking down, but I guess they're far enough away. Uh, Nick is repairing it, and Kelly asks him to tell her all about Kelly Catwell. So, this will give Nick a chance to say wonderful things about Kelly Capwell to Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, at the Waits Motel, the sheriff shows up with two dinners that his wife had prepared for Cruz and Eden. And Eden shows the sheriff the fake note from Nick that they found. And Eden is angry that Cruz is giving Nick the benefit of the doubt and not Sophia. And Cruz says, well, this could be just another setup. Like when Marcello tried to set up Peter Flint, or when Sophia tried to set up Lionel Lockridge, which probably is a little dig at Eden. Mm -hmm. uh, the farmers show up. The Vietnamese farmers uh, reveal that they saw Nick, uh, and I guess they decided that Cruz and Eden seemed trustworthy after all. Uh, but that Kelly wasn't with him, although Nick is looking for a woman, and they had. Uh, uh, told him that the old silo might be a good hiding place, and that's where he's gone. So, uh, Cruz and Eden, and the police officer, I believe, uh, the sheriff, go to the silos, and they search six silos before finding the right one. Find some evidence of food and drink, and some bullet casings that Cruz smells and says have been recently fired. And Cruz thinks Kelly and Nick are both in serious danger. So they're at the silos. I don't know if they're too late or if uh, if Renfro and the others are actually going to come back to the silo. So I mean, the last time we saw them, all they were with Jack, and Jack's, you know, gotten all the way back to Santa Barbara. So possibly they um, they are not coming back there at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe our thought that the the nuclear silos were somehow involved in the plan or wrong. It just may have been a convenient place to hide that was abandoned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, back on the sound stage, Frank Armstead suddenly has a wig on that is somewhat reminiscent of the large amount of hair that Lionel has. And it's also gray, graying for no particular reason since Augusta's blind. Uh, Lionel is coaching Frank to continue kissing Augusta for five more minutes. Uh, Augusta continues to say disparaging things about Lionel throughout. Uh, and then uh, Lionel cues Harvey to start the romantic music. And the uh, hard of hearing sound man cranks up the 1812 overture to its <laughs> loudest setting. Uh, Lionel dismisses the rest of the crew and then switches places with Frank, unbuttoning his shirt and... Frank actually has his pants off at this point, and Augusta actually starts at uh, the site of his his uh, boxers, but uh, manages to cover. And uh, Lionel does what they they had done a few weeks ago, where he switches places with Frank and starts kissing Augusta, and, and wanting to be silent, but Augusta, of course, knowing it's Lionel, says, uh, Oh! Tell me more about the moon, Frank. Mm -hmm. So Lionel has no choice but to switch back with Frank. 
And when Frank returns, he says, Augusta, I'm back. I was just looking at the moon to refresh my memory. <laughs> First of all, it looks very round, although you couldn't tell that from down here. It's very deserted. <laughs> Augusta has Frank close the curtains so Lionel can't see what's going on, and then she whispers to Frank that she knows everything and to play along. So she and Frank jump up and down on the bed, making indecent noises. While, all the while, Augusta is disparaging Lionel's lovemaking skills. Lionel says, I'll never drink milk again. <laughs> <laughs> he finally can't take it anymore and pulls over the curtain to see Frank and Augusta jumping up and down on the bed and realizes that Augusta can see. And he says, I did it all for you. And she says, well, you made a fool out of me. So thus endeth the... Frank Armstead scam. Mm -hmm. Later at the Lockridge Mansion, Augusta comes in and Lekin realizes almost immediately that she can see. And Augusta says that she learned a lot while she was blind who her enemies were. Lionel shows up and Augusta tells him to leave right away. And they start arguing and Lekin realizes she better leave them to it and goes to her room. Mm -hmm. And the argument uh, has Augusta throwing a vase at him. Lionel says, why don't you ever throw anything expensive? Yeah. Augusta says, we don't have anything expensive. Mm -hmm. Lionel says, what about San Simeon? She says, third rate, like you. <laughs> so somehow in the end, they manage to talk themselves into a corner, and Augusta says that Lionel has to take her to the real San Simeon to make it up to her. In a real plane. And a real man, if you can find him. So this uh, makes me think it, maybe this plan has worked a little bit on Augusta, because mm -hmm. otherwise she wouldn't bother even trying to, you know, get Lionel to to do all that. Mm -hmm. Now, that also reminds me about the Lockridge finances. Apparently he spent quite a bundle on the soundstage uh, debacle, and now he's going to try and get San Simeon. So we know a lot of their paintings are fake. Yeah. He must have some discretionary account or something that he's been drawing from because I think that Brick has a pretty firm handle on most of the finances and has been managing the portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, did remember that time that he had that discussion with Minx? Did did she agree to give him some maybe some some of the portfolio back, or no? He had to. Oh yeah, he had to prove himself by getting that job, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe that hasn't played out to the end yet. He or maybe given... he spent all his all of his Zimmerman's income on the soundstage. Now. That could be. Yes, he's sold a lot of mattresses and made a yeah. lot of commission. So very few Capwells in this episode, other than Kelly, I think, mm -hmm. well, and a little bit, of, be, Eden. bit of Eden. But nothing at the Capwell Mansion. A lot of locations, the soundstage and the, uh, well, not real locations, but uh, new sets anyway. And some, a silo set and a hotel set in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, and I assume we'll be seeing a lot more of the woods as Kelly and Nick, you know, are on the run from the henchmen. And who knows what Jack will, I mean, it seems like Jack will have to, faux Jack will have to go after Brick himself, really, without any help. That's probably yeah. why we saw him getting that gun out. So. And, like, and maybe confronting Christy about a certain necklace. Or Augusta will, actually. Yep. Well, probably I would think we'll see Gina again at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. Somehow getting bustled out of the institution. Like mm -hmm. Probably see Mason as well. We haven't seen him for a little bit, so... Yeah, we'll see how Santana uh, manages to get Brandon on her side before Gina comes back. But I mm -hmm. guess if Gina goes on the run, who knows where she'll be. She might yes. go up to Lone Pine and then to Santana Kelly. Santana might have a little more time to work on that. Mm -hmm. Although CC was pretty against it last time. So. That is all for this Monday episode. Uh, we will return in a few seconds, having watched... Episode 234, and presumably you also will watch that episode and pretend that it is 1985. June, oh, it's the end of the school year. So, summer holidays coming up. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.
I'll tell you, tell some I'm never going to drink milk again. Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 234 of Santa Barbara, originally aired Tuesday, June 25th, 1985. And I would have still been working at whatever summer job and probably only seeing a few minutes of each episode in in real time, if any at all. Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara teen scene summertime fun time. Santa Barbara teen scene summertime fun time. Santa Barbara teen scene summertime fun time. Summertime. Lakin is having lunch at the Orient Express, and Ted is her server, and Christy is in her proper uniform for once. Uh, Lakin tells Ted that Christy uh, used to talk about her all the time, but she's not uh, talking about him anymore. She wonders if something happened between them. And uh, Ted says she's a tough kid and she can bounce back from anything, mm -hmm. which Lakin finds actually kind of odd. Cece shows up and he's angry because he's found out that Ted is not going to Stanford after all, but is going to USB. And when he finds out it's because of Lakin, he urges Lakin to talk to him. He said the decent thing would be to talk him out of it. Um, Ted says he's old enough to make his own decisions. I think uh, Lakin found out too late that her mom could see and uh, too late to, you know, switch schools. And so she's, she says to Cece that she has to go to USB for mm -hmm. at least this first semester. Christy's sister, Sister Mary, arrives dressed in a habit. It's mm -hmm. like a light gray color. Quite an ornate one. Mm. She asks Christy to please come home for their mother's birthday. And she promises that mom has stopped drinking. Uh, Christy really does not want to go. She asks if Steve will be there. And um, in the end, she tells Mary she's not going. Uh, Ted thinks it's funny that Christy's sister is Sister Mary. And uh, Christy tells Ted that she wants to be a better person. She says, maybe I'll take a night school class in how not to act like a jerk. So after a bit of a talk with Ted, she decides that she will go after all, uh, but she returns having missed the last bus out of town, and Ted offers to drive her. So I'm not sure what town the Duvalls live in, or how far from Santa Barbara that is, but it sounds like it, you know, if there's a bus involved, it's going to be a couple hour drive. Well, I think her original story was that she was from Minnesota. Mm. I doubt they're driving to Minnesota, but... Uh, Maybe the mom doesn't live in Minnesota. Maybe the mom lives somewhere in California. That's what I'm assuming. It'll be like Chico or something. Santa Barbara teen scene, summertime, fun time. Santa Barbara teen scene, summertime, fun time. Santa Barbara teen scene, summertime, fun time. Summertime. Kelly looks at her own reflection. Uh, and... Uh, then says to Nick that uh, she likes that he's peaceful. So I think uh, maybe you know, with all the trauma Kelly's had, uh, this is kind of a refreshing change, not having to think about everything. Because mm -hmm. Nick has told her all about the fact that she's a widow and everything, and she says she really can't get her head around it, and there's, there's nothing really in in that those stories that rings a bell with her. Yeah, in a way, perhaps... Um Unintended, I'm sure, by Dr. Renfro, but maybe this is actually being a little bit uh, medicinal for Kelly in that losing her memory has finally helped her get over Joe and probably Peter. the... And Peter. Marcello. And Marcello. Yeah. Uh, the farmers give them a week's worth of dried food and uh, they head out into the woods. And at one point, uh, while Kelly is dancing with a tree, Nick is scouting ahead, and he finds them a ghost town to hang out in. And we were talking about how that we've probably seen that ghost town in numerous westerns, depending on where they shot that. I think we've probably seen it in a few old episodes of Mannix, and uh, mm. I wouldn't be surprised if it's shown up in some other shows we've seen. Like, I, I'm sure I, I've seen something like that in... Adam 12, I think the monkeys mm -hmm. ended up in a ghost town at one point. 
Sure, it's a they, standard uh, ghost town. They end up entering a saloon. I mean, it's one of those corner buildings with sort of the angled corner, so maybe it's even the saloon from Brett Maverick that was kind of on the corner and still seemed to be a bit painted red. Um, and then when they switch to the interior of the saloon, I think it's no longer location. It's uh, now a soundstage. But yeah, uh, Kelly gets another location uh, shoot. And Nick does too. So. Uh, back in Santa Barbara, Foe Jack calls Renfro and tells him he better make sure they find Nick and Kelly and dispose of them. It's time to start reaping the rewards. New Stalin or bust, he says. Uh, Renfro suggests that Foe Jack will have to look in on his cousin when he's in New Stalin. He says, I want to look at him just long enough to know that they've killed him. So he really hates his cousin. And I think, you know, the, some of this hatred of his cousin is actually really needs to be played, played out for us, the audience, to buy some mm -hmm. of the things that Foe Jack is doing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the fact that, you know, he's kind of letting Julia um, walk all over him in a way that might be jeopardizing their mission but I think it is explained by the fact that he really hates Jack and wants to one-up him on everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not just that he wants to sleep with Julia, but that he wants to sleep with Julia uh, because she wants to sleep with Jack, I think. I think it would be interesting to know what exactly they have in mind with New Stalem. You know, he's, he says basically New Stalem. Or bust. So, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Is he going to become the um, president of New Salem? Is that being promised to him, or mm -hmm. you know? Well, I mean, he's got the t he's got uh, he's got the plane ticket on his desk. So, mm -hmm. I think we'll be finding out probably in the next episode. Uh, there'll be a new you know uh, fork to this storyline, and we'll finally get to see what's going on. In in the palace, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Chuck and James report that they've lost Kelly and Nick. And Foe Jack says, A woman with no memory and a man who takes baby pictures for a living? How can anybody be so incompetent? At the airport, not sure if it's the Santa Barbara airport or the San Simeon airport, uh, but Lionel is making a call from the payphone to try and get himself and Augusta into the bedroom at San Simeon. And he is not having any luck with, I guess, Hearst's secretary. I mean, I don't think Hearst was alive anymore, so I don't know. They, they keep talking about having been friends with Hearst, but uh, maybe there's a younger Hearst there they're talking about. And I, as from what I remember, actually going to the castle, most of it is just... You know, it, it's it's an exhibit, basically. I don't know, perhaps they rent out some of it for events or something, but it didn't look to me like a place you could actually stay in. I don't recall if they said Hearst family members actually stayed there or if mm -hmm. there was a wing that they Maybe. kept segregated for them. I mean, it was kind of like Graceland in a way. Um, so he even resorts to pretending to be C.C. Capwell. And I didn't think he did a very good C.C. Capwell no, impression. No, he did not. But Augusta did. Yeah. Augusta is really, in one way, into it for this trip. But in another way, uh, not because Lionel is continually failing to impress her. Uh, because they actually end up at a dive motel in a terrible room. And she says, she's trying to make the best of it. She says, can we at least order champagne from room service and he thinks maybe he can scrounge up a couple of beers from the night manager so um, Augusta gives Julia a call while Lionel's in the shower to let her know how inauspicious the night of a thousand pleasures is uh, going and uh, Julia mentions her issues with Jack and uh, even though Augusta was so jealous of Julia this whole time and interested in Jack, she actually tells Julia um, the way to make sure uh, that, that really is Jack is to sleep with him. Mm -hmm. So I guess, even though it hasn't really been explicitly said, and the leap to Julia thinking it's not really Jack is kind of glossed over, um, 
it seems like off camera, Julia has been saying to Augusta, oh, maybe it's someone pretending to be Jack. It's the only way that we can really justify um, some of the discussions we've heard, Julia. I took it as um, Augusta kind of saying to her, you know, you don't really know a man until you've slept with him or something like that, meaning it more euphemistically because she was so disgusted with Lionel at mm. that point. And that kind of popping a light bulb off, bulb off in Julie, Julia's head that, um, you know, something is definitely being off with Jack. So maybe sleeping with him will give her a bit more insight into what's going on. I didn't necessarily think that she had actually gone so far as to say, oh, this is a doppelganger mm. for the real Jack. But I, I had a sense that maybe she felt that by taking things to this next level, she could get a little bit more insight into what was bothering her about him. Hmm. Well, we'll see. Uh, she's definitely decided to sleep with him. Meanwhile, at the dive motel, Lionel comes out of the shower, and uh, we find out later that he has failed to perform any of the Night of a Thousand Pleasures that he had promised Augusta. He says, it's not for lack of interest. I'm sure it's nothing permanent. And Augusta says... Today has left a lot to be desired. So that, I seem to remember uh, originally when this aired that I was somewhat disappointed because I was really thinking they were going to do a location uh, thing in San Simeon. Yeah, and I, that clearly did not happen. I think what has been a bit, um, a bit of a letdown in this storyline for me is that I really wanted Augusta to take bigger revenge, you know, rather than mm. just jumping up and down on a bed with, um, with, uh, what's his Frank. Name? Frank. I keep thinking Hank with Frank. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, think, uh, I wanted her to do something a little bit more. I think I had the same thought original when it originally aired. Um, not that I really remembered it until I was seeing it again and then I, it all came back to me but uh, um, I realized after the last episode oh that's the end of that story mm -hmm. um, that's the end of the revenge so um, yeah it's true that did sort of peter out a little bit um, and then now this promise of Sam, San Simeon is probably disappointing to us as it was to Augusta that they didn't end up there now, early in the day, Julia was jazzercising, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Brick came in and asked her how she feels about Jack Stanfield Lee. And uh, Brick tells her that he thinks Jack had something to do with kidnapping Amy's baby. Now, at first, Julia doesn't want to have anything to do about it, but then she remembers that she has these questions about Jack. So then she decides to, you know, get the whole story from Brick, and he wants to know if there's a way they can legally search through Jack's files, but Julia says, no, there's no, there's no way you're going to get a judge to order that based on what you've got. But she tells him she'll think about it, if she can think of some, some way to help him. Um, then later, she searches, doesn't really search Jack's office, but she kind of snoops around while she's in there writing a note. She's told Amy that she wants to leave a note, and Amy's just let her in there on her own for a while although Amy does come in and out. Um, Julia leaves, and then Brick shows up and argues with Amy, and uh, then Brick hides behind the door when Jack shows up and uh, manages not to run into Jack. Then Julia comes back and tells Jack that she saw his plane ticket, and uh, he tells her that he has been sent on a sudden mission for the president, and Julia says she wants to go to Vienna with him, and... He thinks it over and agrees. She sort of implies that she is going to sleep with him. So um, he tells her to meet him at the airport at 6 p.m. So uh, next time we see Jack, he's busily shredding documents in his office. And Brick comes in and says, what are those? Give me those. I want to see them. And tries to grab him out of the shredder. And they fight. And Brick is about to punch out Jack. Or he does punch out uh, faux Jack, I think. Uh, and uh, I figure... Okay, now he's going to see what the documents are, but Chuck and James show up with their guns drawn, and uh, Rick is once again stopped. 
So now, uh, I think the, uh, there's a possibility that our, that Nick and Kelly and Rick and Amy and Julia could all end up in, in the same, uh, circle at some point and exchange notes, but, uh, they are actually kind of segregated from each other a little bit, so we'll see if they do actually. I mean, it'd be funny if, if Rick ended up in a jail cell in New Staland and Julia ended up in a, in a suite in the same building. Uh, with Jack, not realizing that the other's there. Yeah, we'll just have to see how it shakes out. I'm kind of wondering, you know, we already just talked a little bit about uh, faux Jack Stanfield Lee's motivations, and I'm almost wondering if he'll try to parade Julia past the real Jack Stanfield Lee at some point just to show how much he has mm. taken over his identity in his life and mm -hmm. all the things he Have Jack cared behind about. a two-way mirror or something so he can witness. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That could happen. Yeah, because he really does seem to hate Jack. For and that might be an opportunity slight. for a bit of a, a reunion as well, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, that is it for this episode. That was a Tuesday. We'll be back for Wednesday. And uh, we invite our viewers to guess what I'm going to be for Halloween, because in the real world, it's October 16th right now, whereas in Santa Barbara, when we return, it will be Wednesday, June 26th, when we watch episode 235 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye. Is <laughs> that what you were waiting for? <laughs> <laughs>to episode 235 of Mission and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. We've watched the Wednesday, June 26th, 1985 episode of Santa Barbara. And in the silo, Cruz and Eden argue. Cruz kisses Eden, but she's not having any of it. Uh, she ends up talking about her mother again, and how uh, she finally concludes that he used her mother to get even with her, which I don't quite see if that logic follows. Uh, then Cruz says, uh, they start, she starts talking about the class differences, and Cruz says that the Casillos owned 100,000 acres in California while the Capwells are still coming over in steerage class on the Mayflower. And then even changes tactics and says that he resents uh, that their family no longer has all that land. And then a weird doctor shows up that we didn't know was coming, and don't know who he is, uh, and he identifies Dr. Renfro's memory machine. He doesn't say it's Dr. Renfro's, he just says, oh, this is a machine that can be used to manipulate memory. So, um, not quite sure how he's familiar with that machine. He says there's only a few of them in the world, but yet Dr. Renfro, I think, claims to have invented it in an earlier episode, so I don't know if he's invented it, but also done seminars on how he's invented it uh, to the medical community. Well, I think the doctor says this is a type of memory machine, so that suggested to me that there's several different kind of models out there, although I would mm. think it would definitely narrow the search down to who is, is a, a candidate for being responsible for this, mm -hmm. because there's only a certain number in the world, and I expect, like many pieces of highly specialized equipment, there's only a very few people who could operate it. So, I think it's surprising that they would have left such an expensive piece of equipment behind. Yeah. Because, you know, he had several different people going in different directions, and really Chuck and James were the ones responsible for chasing Nick and Kelly, and both Jack or Dr. Renfro could have, you know, grabbed that machine, I think. Yeah, I, I I think that's a really good point. If if watching old episodes of Mission Impossible and even early James Bond movies have taught us anything, that a piece of high tech equipment um, is not something people just um, leave lying around and forget about. Mm -hmm. That's that drives the entire plot of some movies. Meanwhile, in the ghost town, Nick and Kelly hang out in the saloon. They find an old camera, they find uh, a water pump that they get working, and uh, they find a player piano which plays Sweet Georgia Brown. Number one hit of 
1885. Um, but Nick backs away whenever, whenever Kelly tries to touch him, which she doesn't really understand, but of course he doesn't want to take advantage of her with her memory being wiped. Uh, kind of like how uh, Robin Wright is playing Kelly now, as kind of childlike with yeah. you know her memories missing. Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara summertime fun time teen scene. Santa Barbara teen scene summertime fun time. It's Ted and Christy driving around uh, California. Why did you lie to me about being from Minnesota? Is the first thing Ted says. So, this is interesting, because we were just talking about that yesterday, and whether they were driving to Minnesota or not. What's wrong with being from Madeira? Which, according to the map, is somewhere north of Fresno. I think it's even further from Santa Barbara than Lone Pine is. Um, and then uh, Christy asks about Ted's family, and then Ted says, You have a brother, don't you? And Christy says, He's a stepbrother. He was already there when my dad met my mom. He's the assistant DA in L.A., which Ted thinks sounds impressive. Christy says, yeah, I used to think that, but then I find out he's like one in a hundred. <laughs> so he's basically the same job that Mason had uh, when we first started the show. Yeah, it really makes me wonder if we're going to meet him at some point. We may have... Uh, Mason and Julia and and uh, Christie's brother all in a court case together. And Lindsay. And Lindsay. Got four lawyers on the show then. Um, Ted discovers, just as he's dropping her off, that Christy forgot to get a gift for her mom. Christy says, oh, well, I'm here. That's her gift. So uh, she doesn't want Ted to come in, so he drives off, and Mary answers the door. And Christy's mother's just hiding a bottle when Mary opens the door. And Theta Bassett is being played by Grace Zabriskie, who uh, you may recognize as either Laura Palmer's mother from Twin Peaks, which filmed about five years after this, mm -hmm. or Susan's mother from Seinfeld, mm. more like uh, 15 years after this. So... Um, Ted returns, and he has a gift, and pretends that Christy had left it on the seat of his Jeep. Yeah. And, uh, Theta says, nice-looking Jeep. Reverse chic, they call it. I bet that one costs big bucks. So we see where Christy gets her obsession with money from. And Ted says, well, I wouldn't know. So it's implying that he got it as a gift, I guess, or he's just trying to be polite and not talk about money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christy's mother opens the expensive perfume and says to Christy, I know what this junk costs. Where did you get the money for stuff like this, you little whore? Who do you sleep with to pay for this? So now we have the rest of the story on Christy's home life, I think. Yeah, the whole uh, scene, really, as soon as she enters the house, is very tense. Mm hmm Yeah. She's chain-smoking the whole time. Uh, she's kind of jittery. Yeah. Because she's hiding her drinking. Clearly Mary thinks she has stopped drinking. Yeah, now I was, I was sort of wondering about Mary's role in all this because it's very obvious, you know, to a casual observer such as ourselves watching the show that, um, Christie's mother is, is not well and is not very stable and is not very capable. And that's definitely, I think, played to the hilt in this uh, whole scene. And it, I, the whole time I was watching it, I was wondering if Mary was just oblivious to this or if she had some ulterior motive for, for bringing Christy back to look after her mom, um, mm. maybe to offload uh, the responsibility onto her. I don't know. We don't really know enough about this family to know sort of what the dynamics are beyond what we see in this scene, which which is not very positive. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christy really tried to keep Ted out. Yeah. Um, now he's somewhat uncomfortable in the house. And uh, after the discussion about uh, whether Christy is sleeping with Ted, um, they kind of scuffle a bit, uh, yeah. Christy and her mom, Theta, and uh, they end up 
jostling the the couch or, or armchair or whatever it was where Chris where Theta had hidden the bottle, and it gets dislodged and ends up uh, on the floor. And Christy yeah. says, "You lied to me." Yeah. So this is the big thing, really, with Christy is that Theta promised to stop drinking. I guess I think probably that is the root of all the family's problems. I would think. Well, I think Christy raises has raised another point in the past too, which of course was something we as viewers noticed right off the bat. But when she did try to call home uh, a few weeks back, you know, the first thing her mom wanted was money. So mm -hmm. we've we've also remember met Christy's aunt as well, who basically took the same line as Mary that Christy should come home and mm -hmm. her mom's changed and. So, again, it seems like there is some dynamic in the family where there's a certain element that the family is very invested in, uh, for lack of a better word, enabling Christie's mom and pretending all is perhaps better than it is, and for whatever reason, bringing Christy home as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Christy asks her at one point if she's, you know, working yet, and she says, I think Richard is the, the name she says, oh, Richard says, you know, he's holding my job for me. Yeah. And later, when the doorbell rings and it's Ted, uh, Theta says, "Oh, maybe it's Richard. Richard just come to, to pinch my butt." So I don't know where she works, but clearly this is some kind of weird, yeah, a work environment as well. At least looking at it from twenty twenty eyes. Yeah. And uh, Ted mistakenly calls uh, Theta Mrs. Duval, and she says, "Oh no, it's Bassett. I, uh, I." Uh, met Christie's dad after I was married to Mr. Bassett or something like that. So and I guess Mary's a Duval too, so the old the brother the older brother must be however the brother must be older than both of them. Summertime Back in Santa Barbara, they kind of did a re staging of the scene we saw in Jack's office. This time we see Brick has knocked Jack unconscious. Jack is lying there, faux Jack. Uh, and then James and uh, and Chuck burst in as Brick manages to get out of the um, out of the office. So uh, Jack shouts to them, "Don't come back before he's dead." So once again, Brick is being chased, or someone's being chased by Chuck and James. Uh, Brick runs to the Lockridge house and gets Lionel's gun from the desk drawer, where we know he always keeps it from the murder. And uh, Julia's there, and he says surprises Julia by saying Jack is trying to kill him and probably kidnap Damie's baby. Uh, Julia goes directly to Jack's office and uh, runs into Amy and tells Amy she doubts Jack has Amy's baby or is trying to kill Brick. Which is kind of interesting. So, you know, she has her suspicions about Jack, but she doesn't think it's that. It's quite as excessive as Brick thinks, which is odd, because clearly he's a bit worried, worried enough to get a gun. Although, logically, would you necessarily leap to that? You know, unless Brick has been much more intimately involved with this than Julia has. But I'm sure I guess she'll come he around. didn't. I mean,. I thought you told her the whole story, you know, but yeah. uh, earlier in the last episode. But. So Brick uh, breaks into Jack's hotel room and waits for him, only to find that Dr. Renfro lets himself in. And he ends up knocking out Dr. Renfro and bringing him to the Perkins house and ties him up in a chair. And then he and Amy threaten Renfro. Amy says, tell me where my baby is. And Renfro says, you'll die for this, both of you. So he's kind of dropped some of his pretense there, uh, that he doesn't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, Rick tells Amy to play bad cop, and Amy takes the gun and says, You're going to tell me where my baby is right now, or I'm going to pull this trigger. So that's where we've left Dr. Renfro. Uh, and then just at the end of the Jack enters his hotel room and sees Renfro's spilled medical bag and realizes something's up. So I don't know... If he will guess correctly that Brick has kidnapped Renfro and that Amy's house is probably the most likely place, but uh, we'll see if uh, Chuck and James or or Jack figures out that uh, Brick is at the Perkins house. I mean, that's where he lives, I guess. So. 
and I guess we'll also see, you know, I mean, one thought I had was, or one question I had was how invested Jack is in Dr. Renfro, really. I mean, he's... Because mm -hmm, he's on his way out of town. <laughs> yeah, he's got a plane ticket to New Salem, and it didn't necessarily sound like he was coming back, I mean, if he was expecting to take over the country or something. So um, maybe maybe Renfro is still, um, is still in play because he could definitely finger Jack as being part of this and, you know, all the other things he's been involved with. But, you know, at some point he might be expendable to foe Jack as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, foe Jack may just say, oh, I'll go out of town and leave Kelly and Nick yeah. Kendrick to, and Amy to Renfro to yeah. deal with. So that's a Wednesday episode, kind of an exciting mm -hmm. Wednesday. Anything else you want to discuss in this episode? Or? Not really. All right, we'll be back after we watch episode 236 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye-bye. All right, well, uh, drop me a card when you get to Vienna. Let me know how you're enjoying the pastries. Don't eat too many of them. How long do you plan to be gone? Two and a half weeks, if everything works out all right. And if all goes beautifully? Do you ever keep your thoughts to yourself, Mason? Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 236 of Santa Barbara, originally aired Thursday, June 27th, 1985. Santa Barbara teen scene, summertime, fun time. Christy accuses Mary of lying to her about her mother's drinking. And I don't think Mary really uh, rebutted that. I think Mary kind of looked a bit guilty, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then she is horrified to find that her brother Steve has shown up at the party. Mm -hmm. Christy says she wants to go back to Santa Barbara immediately, but Steve grabs her arm and forces her into the living room. He says, we haven't had a chance to talk for a long time. Steve says he doesn't like it when Christy and Theta fight. Christy starts to cry and runs out of the house, uh, where Ted is still starting up his Jeep, and Christy gets in the Jeep and... Drives away with Ted, even though he does try to talk her into staying, because they drove all that way. Uh, Theta wonders why Christie's visits always go so badly. <laughs> then Steve announces the good news, that he's the new district attorney uh, in Santa Barbara. Or is it a... no, assistant district attorney. I think he's basically going to be doing Mason's old mm -hmm. job, which should be really fun. He's the new assistant district attorney in Santa Barbara. So he'll be able to keep an eye on Christy. I somehow don't think Christy will be too happy about that. No, no, I felt kind of sorry for Christy in this uh, whole thing because she's the one being yelled at and smacked around and uh, no one really seems to be taking her side of things, including Ted, who offers her this little bit of moralizing at the end about the importance of family. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, today, if this were caught on a phone camera, you know, Christy's mom would be in the middle of a Twitter storm and probably arrested or something, so... Yeah, it doesn't look like she had a happy family life. I can see why she doesn't like to go back. And I think she pretty much said this was the last straw for for her. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll find out a little more down the road why everyone in the family seems so invested in her um, remaining in the family and, and why they're so invested in her um, making amends um, with her mom and why they're so protective of, of the mom as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christy fantasizes about Ted on the ride home. Mm -hmm. She's got a fantasy of... She's living in the Lockridge Mansion and she's dressed up in what I, I believe looked a bit like uh, Madonna's Material Girl dress and, and diamond necklace. And she fantasizes about Ted in a tuxedo coming to visit, and then she reboots her fantasy a little bit and tones down her dress slightly. Um, in the end, they get back to Santa Barbara, which, as I mentioned, was probably a five-hour drive, and it looks like the middle of the night, and they stop in front of a gate. Now, we haven't previously seen that the Lockridges have a gate. We know the mm -hmm. Capwells do from the very first 
week when Minx was uh, stopped there. But it uh, looks like the Lockridges also have a gate. Um, I don't think they were at the Capitol Gate because Christy says, I've got to get inside, which mm -hmm. implies to me they were parked outside the Lockridges. So I think I doubt Ted would, you know, make her walk half a mile down the road to the Lockridge Gate. He would have dropped her off as close as possible, mm -hmm. I think. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting they have a gate because of last week, you know, last episode, Jack Stanfield Lee was waiting for Julia and getting the car going, and I presume he parked up the driveway, but maybe he was parked on the road in front of the gate, and that's why he was gone so long when, when Julia was on the phone with, uh, with, uh, Brick. Maybe they're at the back. Well, looking at that map of, uh, of, uh, that road that we had last week. The back, I think, is the those canyons or those, mm. you know, that desert terrain that goes into the canyons and cliffs and caves that we saw Ted and Warren horseback riding in previously and Santana getting lost uh, that one time. So I think there's only just that one road. Summertime. Back in Santa Barbara, Cece has summoned Mason to find out how he tricked G9 into signing over control over Brandon tr Brandon's trust fund. He thinks Mason blackmailed Gina. And Mason just says, oh, well, she had something I wanted, and uh, I had something she wanted, and we made an exchange. Uh, at the same time, Santana has shown up, because uh, she mentions Rosa has the flu, and Mason uh, jabs at her, saying, oh, you took advantage of that to come and see Brandon. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, Mason's totally on Gina's side now, but over Brandon, which, you know, previously I would have thought Mason might have been a, a good ally for Santana mm -hmm. uh, to try to get Brandon, but I guess she was out of town at the wrong time, and now Mason and Gina are, are really much closer. Yeah, and I, I feel like... Um She's had a somewhat fiery relationship with Mason ever since she she got back. Yeah, and her relationship with Cece is not good either. So. No, no. Um, Santana says that she doesn't think Gina will ever get out of uh, rehab, but uh, Brandon overhears and uh, misinterprets that to mean that Gina will never be coming back, so he starts crying. Uh, so Cece asks Santana to go visit Gina and find out how Mason talked her into signing over the trust fund control. Uh, so Santana goes for a visit, uh, tries to make it go a little better than the last one by opening with a gift from Brandon, but when she slides in, oh, why did you sign over Mason as the, uh, as, uh, the controller? Uh, she tells Santana to mind her own business. Now, we're... Uh, assuming that Gina is still pregnant at this point. Mm hmm They haven't actually talked about it for She a doesn't while. look pregnant, but, you know, it's hard to tell how time goes in these soap operas. Mm-hmm. Gina calls Mason and begs him to come, and she tells him about Santana's visit. He actually says, oh, did she uh, try to get you to tell tell her why, uh, why you signed over control of the trust fund? And uh, what did you tell her? She says, oh, I told her to mind her own business. And then uh, she wants to get uh, borrow some money from Mason. And Mason has $300 and says, this will have to be a loan because I really can't afford to give you $300. So uh, as soon as she gets the money, Gina sends him away and then goes over to Marcia and says she'll pay anything to get out of La Puerta. I think she's oversold it because she really only has $300. <laughs> She should have said, I'll pay you $300 to get me out of here. And I found actually this conversation a little bit confusing because I thought that in one of our previous conversations between Gina and Marcia, Marcia sort of said, you know, I could get you out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this conversation, Marcia is I mean, like, she has no idea what Gina's talking about. I think it's just another case of a different writer writing this episode. Mm -hmm. Maybe the beats had been uh, written down, but not not thoroughly, or enough time has passed that they thought it needed to be restaged for the viewer mm, who might maybe. not have seen, you know, last week's episode. 
Julia tells Mason she's going to Vienna with Jack because his personality has completely changed. Mason says, drop me a card when you get to Vienna and let me know how you're enjoying the pastries. And Julia said, he asks how long she's going for, and Julia says, for two and a half weeks if everything works out all right. Mason says, and if everything goes off beautifully. So she doesn't actually take, take uh, that in a, in a lighthearted spirit. Uh, at the Perkins' house, in exchange for Amy not shooting him, Dr. Renfro agrees to tell them where the baby is. Unfortunately, Chuck shoots Dr. Renfro through the window of the, of the Perkins' house uh, before he can say where the baby is. Brick and Amy run out the back as Chuck, James, and Faux Jack come in the front door. Faux Jack uh, tells Renfro, and Renfro says, Oh, get me to a hospital. You're expendable! And he just leaves Renfro there to bleed. So Renfro, I think, has had enough with Faux Jack. He says, they'll get you too someday. Amy and Brick are determined to get you. They're crazy. They'll kill you. You'll still have to deal with the real Jack Lee. You aren't half the man he is. Not even... Ugh. And then <sighs> Dr. Renfro dies. So he managed to get a good dig in on Faux Jack. Because that's exactly the sort of thing that, that he would be uh, sensitive about. This the real Jack Lee. And we were actually speculating in our last episode how this was going to go because we were saying at some point uh, Dr. Renfro will be expendable to foe Jack if he's on perhaps a one-way ticket to New Salem. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, seen the end of Dr. Renfro, another psycho on the show. Um... In the car, Amy finally believes Brick. Uh, he calls Julia, Julia to warn her about Jack, but Julia decides to go to Vienna with him anyway. Uh, Brick and Amy check into a motel, and uh, Amy says she doesn't want to get married until they find Johnny. And Brick says, you don't want circus blood in your family? And they sleep together for the first time, which I'm sure some viewers might care about it was a it was um staged very romantically you know as you would expect a, a soap opera love scene to be staged mm -hmm. so obviously at least for the writers it's just something they were building up to i think their motel was nicer than lionel and augusta's was so yeah i don't know actually how lionel have been a hotel. and augusta managed to find such a terrible uh motel well i think if they were up near san simeon I don't think there was a lot up there that I recall. Was, I seem to remember just a our hotel and... being fairly nice, but yes, there no, wasn't a lot Well, that a was a few there. blocks a few miles away, though. Yeah. Maybe it was six miles. But I don't know. It I, sounds like Lionel left everything to the last minute. So. I mean, honestly, though, if they live in Santa Barbara, they could... They, they didn't have to do a day trip. <laughs> you know, they could have done it in, in a day, gone there and back. I mean, I think maybe... Overnight. Lionel had to avoid the hotel that he used to go to with Sophia because that would have been mm. kind of gauche. So maybe that is how he ended up just pulling in there because he was worried if he kept driving too much longer he'd run into that hotel. Yeah. Yucca Flats Motel, wasn't it? Or Yucca? Something like that. Tree or Yucca Inn? Yeah. The distances aren't really that much. No. At the airport, Julia is reading an article while Jack makes another... Frantic call, and um, the article happens to be about plastic surgery, and she suddenly gets the thought in her head, what if maybe this guy isn't Jack, and he's had plastic surgery to look like Jack? And I guess she's uh, she's uh, thinking it's enough of a possibility that she makes the decision just to leave. And just as she gets up, Faux Jack comes up behind her and grabs her case and says, Time to go! And he starts walking toward the gate. She's got no option but to follow him. So, Julia is going to Vienna, one way or the other. And that is that is it for this episode. So we've lost Dr. Renfro, played by Jordan Charney, but we've gained Steve Bassett, played by Ashby Adams. So, mm -hmm. once again, they've done a swap of a minor, you know, supporting character, I guess, uh, on us. And we've also seen the last this week of Q Chin and Jim Ishida, who played the farming couple. Ah. And 
and uh, Dorothy Dells also has had her final episode. She's played the nurse at La Puerta in, I think, three three episodes. Ah. So that makes me think Gina might be getting out of there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and that is it for episode 236. So we'll be back after 237. See you then. Bye-bye. Dr. Renfro arrived in Santa Barbara, ostensibly because he had heard of Amy Perkins' difficult pregnancy and wanted to offer his services as a specialist in the field. But secretly, his friends Parker Simonson and the man pretending to be Jack Stanfield Lee had a plan to steal Amy's baby and send it to a member of the royal family in the European nation of New Staland. Unfortunately, Brick began to suspect Renfro. Kelly Capwell ran afoul of the conspirators when she spotted Jack's doppelganger cousin smoking, and he enlisted Chuck and Larry to capture Kelly and Nick Hartley. Dr. Renfro psychologically tortured Nick, and then used his autonomic labic retrograder to wipe Kelly Capwell's memory. But Brick got the drop on Dr. Renfro one night, and as he was about to crack and reveal the whereabouts of Amy's baby, Chuck shot him, and Jack's cousin left him to die. Thus, Dr. Renfro joins the residents of Santa Barbara Cemetery. I think my body just remembers to do it on its own. Uh, it could be. I wonder what else it remembers. I wonder if it remembers how to make love. Welcome back. Hello. We have finished episode 237 of Santa Barbara. Original air date, Friday, June 28th, 1985. In the ghost town, Kelly finds some old bloomers. And, like most people, she puts them on. And she also finds a photo of a dancing girl. She dances for Nick and says, My body just remembers. I wonder if it remembers how to make love. So, Nick is trying desperately to fend off Kelly uh, during this uh, episode. Uh, she breaks through the floor of the stage during her dancing and finds a strong box with the diary of Bridget LaBelle, a madam who once worked at the saloon. She reads passages to Nick throughout and then decides that she's going to have a bath. So she prepares a bathtub for herself and tries to get Nick to join her, but he refuses. So she ends up getting him to scrub her back as she reads naughty passages from the diary. And when it's time for Kelly to get out of the tub, Nick has to bring her a towel. And she manages to put his face, her face extremely close to his. So I think uh, Nick's going to have... Uh, I don't think Nick's going to be able to hold out until their rescue. What do you think? Yeah, I think he'll get into some sort of compromising position uh, with Kelly and it uh, it will probably come back to haunt him in some way. Well, I wonder once Kelly gets her memory back if she will be upset if something happens. Now, mind you, and one thing we talked about when we were watching this episode is you do have to wonder how much most people would be turned on by a person basically cosplaying in someone else's underwear. Yes, exactly. You'd think Nick would have decided to take his chances with Dr. Renfro's thugs after that. Mm -hmm. Hundred-year-old underwear found in a random abandoned saloon. Mm -hmm. At La Puerta, Marcia, that's how Gina pronounced it, Marcia. It's the first time I think we've heard her so uh, say it. So, Marcia gives Gina some pills uh, for the road uh, to go along with the trench coat and stolen nurse's ID badge that she's given Gina to help her with her escape. And she tells Gina just to walk out as the shifts are changing and pretend to be one of the night nurses. So, uh, then she wants her payment and Gina says, you know what, you've been ripping me off long enough for these pills, so I'm not going to pay you anything and walks out, hmm. prompting Marcia to set off the alarm. 
but the next time we see Gina, she's at a payphone with the alarms going off in the distance. And she calls Mason, who picks her up and takes her to Sally's apartment. Mm -hmm. um, next time we see Mason, he's picking up Brandon to take him to an early movie. Um, there's a showing of Bambi, which he recalls Cece taking him to when he was a kid. So they go, but instead of going to the movies, Mason takes Brandon to visit his mother, Gina. Mm -hmm. So Brandon's very happy with it. And uh, they seem to be in Sally slash Kelly slash Mason's apartment. Mm -hmm. When Cece gets the call about Gina's escape, he starts to suspect that Mason was in on it and that uh, Gina had enticed him to bring Brandon to her. Mm -hmm. So he's a little bit surprised when Mason comes home with Brandon after only half an hour. And uh, Mason says, oh, the movie was too full, so we just went for ice cream. Mm -hmm. So he's asked Brandon to keep it quiet about Gina. So uh, Santana, of course, has shown up again uh, with Rosa still being sick. And Cece's not entirely happy with her for trying to insinuate herself into Brandon's life again. But um, then he does agree to let Santana take Brandon home uh, for safekeeping while, you know, a potential kidnapper is out there who's theorized to have Kelly and Rosa's sick and Gina's now on the loose. So he uh, sends Brandon home with Santana. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mason mentions to Gina later where Brandon is, and Gina thinks to herself that Sophia and Santana can fight over Cece as long as she has Brandon, and she shows up at the Andrade house in a taxi, and, uh, Brandon's sitting outside on, on a, uh, cast iron bench that I don't know if we saw last time we saw the Andrade house, which had a huge porch, uh, during the explosion, I recall, but maybe it's been retooled during the rebuilding. Uh, and Santana's just gone inside to fix lunch for Rosa when Gina shows up, and Gina manages to talk Brandon into coming with her in the taxi mm. and leaves Santana a note saying that the boy is with his mother. And I, I think uh, this whole episode shows Gina, you know, she's, she's pretty um, cunning in a lot of ways, but she also tends to make choices that can definitely potentially make her situation worse. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with Marsha, instead of paying her and making a, a clean, quiet exit, she chooses that moment not to pay her and, of course, ends up with the alarms blaring and barely making it out. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with Santana, instead of sort of holding tight and maybe waiting for... Th things to settle down a little bit she comes and gets Brandon and not only does she get him but she leaves a note which uh, you know if she hadn't left the note they might think he had wandered off because they'd had a conversation actually about him wandering into traffic and you know it might have been even an hour or so before they'd noticed him fully missing so. mm -hmm. and she's in a taxi and she's got a bag full of pills yeah so I don't know if she's planning to go back to Sally's, but I think that's the first place Cece's going to look. Now, I was kind of wondering, though, through this episode where you've got this whole thing of Gina escaping, and I don't know, maybe the law is different in different places or whatever, but it would seem to me that if you're just in a rehab facility, you know, you can't necessarily be confined against your will unless you've been... You know, isn't that more something you would find in a in a mental institution? Well, we had uh, we did have Marcia say most of the people here are here voluntarily when Gina first mm -hmm. went there. So the implication is Gina's commitment or whatever committal commitments is not voluntary. Mm -hmm. So they must, uh, I guess, the CC being her husband, he has had the right to commit her. Maybe. Maybe that's it. Maybe I don't remember exactly. Maybe he got a, a judge to commit her, you know, officially. So that that way she would have to get special permission, I guess, to leave. But it just seemed just seemed like a lot for a rehab facility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
maybe because of the fact that she had endangered Brandon that time, she was able to get someone to sign. He was able to get someone to sign off on that. Mm -hmm. Augusta and Lionel return from their disappointing night in the motel. And the next time we see Lionel reading a book on white magic. Uh, and he finds a little recipe to cure his impotence. He whips up a dubious potion with some uh, ingredients that he has to seek out, such as powdered Tibetan yak horn. How does one powder a Tibetan yak horn, he asks. And then later we see him running through the living room with a blender. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, we see a room in the, in the Lockridge house that we haven't seen before. So, camera's here. The living room is there. The back door on the left goes to the dining room, we found out. The one on the right, of course, goes to the basement. And then the front camera right, uh, which we always see people going to, um, that's where Lionel runs with the blender. And then we actually see a little room, the nature of which is not really known. It didn't look like a bedroom. We just saw a little table. Mm -hmm. um, but Lionel mixes up his potion there and... He smells it and balks at drinking it, but then he hears Augusta knocking, so he quickly downs it, and he gains confidence and opens the door and grabs Augusta and starts kissing her. But once in bed with Augusta, he fails to perform once again. So, the turns out the potion is not, mm -hmm. not really effective. At the Capwells... We see a new butler, I think, Harold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we've seen him before. And he won't let Christy in. Uh, Ted ends up having to come to the door. And uh, he says the security's tight since Kelly, you know, went missing. Mm -hmm. uh, she tries to pay him for the perfume that he'd bought for her mom. And she, he refuses to take the money. Uh, now, Cece, of course, uh, has been annoyed with Santana for being too motherly towards Brandon. So decides that what he needs to do is hire a governess for Brandon. Mm -hmm. So at the Orient Express, uh, Christy uh, tells Ted that she's probably going to quit after the next paycheck. Ted says, oh, well, maybe you could take the job as Brandon's governess. Christy says, hmm, like a female governor. Ted says, more like a babysitter. Mm -hmm. um, Following that, Augusta catches Christy returning Minx's locket to the table where she had previously snagged it, so presumably she had hocked that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and Augusta reveals that she had seen her returning the candlesticks, and while well, Christy um, tries to... Um, what's the word? Tries to twist it uh, in her favor by saying mm -hmm. she didn't actually take anything that she didn't return, Augusta kicks her out of the house. Yeah. And she thinks, ha, ha tells like and tell tell your mom I'm gonna be living in the big house next door. So so there. <laughs> um so Cece uh remembers being waited on by Christy uh the one time as he interviews her for the governess position and mm -hmm. she doesn't have a resume but she says, well, I don't take drugs, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> and somehow, uh, you know, his, her tale about wanting to take Brandon to the library to, to read him some books that she mentions that she likes uh, was enough to push Cece over to her side, and uh, he ends up hiring her. Mm -hmm. I, th I think Cece's a bit charmed by her, I, I, because she was quite flirtatious with him in the restaurant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think Cece does rather like that. Mm-hmm. That's true. So Ted helps Christy move her things. She's got five rec record albums in Lincoln's mm -hmm. room. And that's when uh, she tells Lincoln to tell your mom that I'm moving into the big house next door. Uh, Ted does remind Christy that he lives with Mason, so they won't be hanging out all the time at the lot, at the Capwell house. Yeah. Uh, and then Lincoln gives Christy the good news. While you were gone, your brother called. He's the new assistant DA in Santa Barbara. And Christy does not look happy, so... Christy does not look happy. It'll be kind of interesting to delve into that relationship a little further. And I'm also going to be really interested to see how Steve and Mason interact, the former and the present assistant district attorney. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if they will have a chance to interact in some way. Mason, mm -hmm. perhaps as a lawyer, 
and Steve Bassett as Assistant District Attorney. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the end of week 48. Next week is week 49, which uh, will be a bit of a shorter week, because next week we have Dominion Day, or as they've recently started calling it, Canada Day. And we've also got the 4th of July, and we have Wimbledon, which NBC has traditionally preempted all of its soaps for. Mm. So next Thursday and Friday will be Wimbledon coverage, so we will have a three-day week of Santa Barbara next mm. week. And we will be losing a long-time cast member. Mm. Any guesses as to who? Well, let's see. How long-term? Since... I want to say the early days. Early days. Just to make sure I cover everyone who joined the cast a little bit after that first week. You know, there were several characters that came in in the, the weeks, several weeks following. They were interleaved into the story. Hmm. Well, I know there will be a new CC at some point. But I don't know if that'll happen this early on in the game. I know there'll be a new Gina at some point. Just from my research. And is that your guess? Is one of those your guess? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm going to guess Gina. All right. Cast member leaving... And, uh, get any... All right, we'll see. And that is it for week 48 of Santa Barbara. We will see you again. We'll post another episode, well, before Halloween, hopefully, um, so you can see uh, my Halloween costume uh, as we watch week 49 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye-bye. You don't like uh, circus blood in your family?